name of God, creator, redeemer, sustainer, I am bold to bring you this word today. Amen. For Isaiah, it starts with the death of a king. Very specifically, King Uzziah. Now, it happens that Uzziah is a king who is known for having raged, raised a huge army in defense of the nation and known for having a fight with the temple priests that resulted in him being struck with a dread skin disease that left him unclean until the day of his death. It's a brief section of Second Chronicles that mentions Uzziah. So he was a memorable king, but not maybe a most favorable king. And in the year that King Uzziah dies, the prophet is given a vision and challenged to speak into the chaos that so often marks the boundaries of change in our cultures. Now, as it happens, we have just witnessed the death of a monarch and the coronation of her successor. A period of history that will be remembered for its ritual and ceremony, for the proximity to mourning and celebration. And in some corners of the empire, there will be questions raised about the future, the future of the monarchy, the future of our connection to it. And those questions are important, but they don't threaten the fabric of our society. At least I hope they don't. That was not the case in the days of Isaiah and King Uzziah. In those days, the death of a king signaled significant change. So into this time of history comes this vision that Isaiah describes. It's a vision that would leave even the strongest of us cowering in a corner, I think. Smoke and fire, strange singing creatures, thunderous voices, and an urgent command. Whom will speak for us, asks the Lord. And the prophet says, meekly, I imagine, here I am. I'm here already, send me. But this command that Isaiah is given, Judith didn't read for you, I saved the best for myself sometimes. The prophet is told to go and speak to the people of their ignorance. And this is what the Lord commands. Go and say to this people, keep listening but do not comprehend. Keep looking, but do not understand. Make the mind of this people dull. Stop their ears and shut their eyes so that they may not look with their eyes and listen with their ears and comprehend with their minds and turn and be healed. The prophet is asked to call people to ignorance, to blindness, to muddle their comprehension? This is not what we expect of a prophet. Where's, where's the hope? Where's the good news of great joy? The prophet has every reason to be terrified, and it seems now they've been charged with the abandonment of God's people. But I think it's different than that. I think Isaiah has been called to take a chance in a time of great change. See, we have this, this rather all-encompassing idea of what a prophet might be. And we rather denigrate the word in this day and age. 
we're people of the book and we remember great prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah and Amos and Micah. But prophet has come to stand for any street corner shouter who is raging against the state of things. We see them as a little bit, I don't know, unsettled. The guy with the sandwich board in the park that says, repent, the end is near, that kind of thing. Those folks are always with us. There's always somebody who is ready to say it's better then than it is now. They want to tell you how bad it is. How everything was better in the way back when days. That's not a prophet. And the prophets, we remember, the ones who deserve the name, speak into times of change and chaos with reminders of God's faithfulness. Reminders to those who should know better, who have forgotten. Now, the audience for these two different kinds of voices is usually the same. It's you and I. But the response to those different messages is predictable. The street corner shouter, the one raging against the machine, stands up and says, let's go back to when it was great. The prophet says, put your trust in God. Now you hear those two voices side by side, which are you going to choose? Who doesn't want to cheer for the good old days? Who doesn't long for a little safety and security and comfort of memory? Who doesn't want a simpler life and a safer existence? You see, the street corner shouter, I refuse to call them prophets, offer us a safe place to land, and it's back there. The imagined past of our blessed memory. But the prophet urges us toward an unknown future, toward a promise shaped by God's boundless love and grace. And Isaiah is invited to do that, and it's a terrifying invitation. He is invited on a journey of faith, and he's invited to call people to a journey of faith. A journey that will be marked by conflict and endless challenges. Even challenges raised by the religious authorities of the day. He will, in the course of doing his business, run afoul of powerful people. But his message is one of hope in spite of all of this and in spite of the circumstances into which he speaks. And here and now, today, I imagine that there is a model of prophecy that we see in Isaiah that we can actually bear to hear. A prophet, perhaps, whose example we might be bold to follow. For we are navigating the boundaries of change even now. Economic change, climate change, political change. And the changes are marked by sharper differences between the wealthy and the poor, by more dramatic and more frequent weather events, by a political landscape that cultivates fear and distrust. And along those boundaries, the streets and airwaves are full of folks who would have us retreat to an imaginary past where none of this was taking place, where, where crime was less violent. Well, it really wasn't, but they'd like you to think that. Now, people left politics to the politicians. Oh, do you remember that? Yeah, it never happened. And the poor, well, even Jesus told us that the poor would always be with us. So when the subject of the welfare of the poor comes up, there are those who would have us believe that back in the day, 
those unfortunate souls simply worked harder than the people of this corrupt generation. They pulled themselves up by their bootstraps. Except to do that, you have to have boots. These voices that would call us to the past, to traditional values, whatever that means, to so-called simpler times, whatever they were, these are voices that would have us fear the present and dread the future. But guess what? God's people need not fear the present nor dread the future. God's voices, Isaiah's being one, acknowledge the corruption of the day and call for the downfall of the corrupt. So it is only the corrupt that need fear the present and dread the future. It's not a pleasant image that Isaiah paints. It's not exactly good news for those who benefit from a corrupt system. Isaiah does not promote traditional values. No more does Jesus, by the way. Isaiah and Jesus both point to God's care for the whole of creation, for all of humanity. The prophet takes a chance in a time of change to remind the powerful, especially the powerful, that while they imagine themselves masters of the systems they have created, they are ultimately part of God's system. And this is the system that Jesus called the kingdom of God, a way of living and being that looks beyond power and profit to seek compassion and justice, mercy and grace for all. All. Isaiah used language that suggested systems of power and privilege would be torn down and cast aside in favor of the system of God's mercy and justice. Jesus, too, called for upheaval of those structures that valued power over people and privilege over compassion. And Jesus met such resistance that it cost him his life. It's no wonder that we are hesitant when it comes to speaking out. But as followers of Jesus, as, as people of the resurrection, we have access to a courage that helps us face the unknown and speak the truth to power. We can look forward without fear knowing that the downfall of a wicked system, though horrible to behold, is the only way to real justice. I'm not calling for war or, or even what some would call a revolution. I'm reminding you that speaking the truth to power, that calling for justice for the truly oppressed, that opening doors and hands and hearts to the homeless, the addict, the outcast, and the prisoner will lead to resistance from those who benefit from the current system. The rich like being rich. Money is fun. They fight hard to keep it that way. The powerful enjoy being powerful and they will do anything to stay there. Much of what we see is a reaction to a move toward justice, people hanging on more tightly to the things that God despises. Jesus' message, echoed by Isaiah and all the prophets, is that God has a better system. And that's not a message that the powerful want to hear. Still the changes are taking place. You'd have to be blind not to see it. And we are hearing competing voices. 
each trying to justify the thing that brings them the most benefit. So now is the time for the church to take a chance, to add our voices to the chorus, realizing that prophets are never appreciated, but prophets are necessary. And we are called to speak for the voiceless, to champion the poor and oppressed, to point to the system where it is broken and remind the world that there's a better way, a way of compassion, mercy, justice, and love, the way that Jesus pointed, the way that we should walk. Amen.